part, please take out or pull up your Cornell notes from the stalemate, and then the United States goes from being neutral to actually being part of the war. You should check your answers or your notes against um, the lecture, and then making any changes, corrections, and then interacting with your notes. So number one, um, just neither side during this war thought that the war would last for very long. So starting in August of 1914, the German Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, actually told his army that they should be home by fall. So thinking that the fall is typically October or November. So obviously they had no idea that it was going to drag on for four years. Most of the fighting is going to take place um, in an area along the German and French border. So it was referred to as the Western Front. And the reason the war took so long is because it ended up being a stalemate. And so they would go back and forth and nobody was really making any progress. And the reason for this was the type of fighting that they resorted to using, which was called trench warfare. And we will go a little bit more in depth in that when we do new technologies. So neither side um, by 1916 could actually claim a victory because it was a stalemate. Just a reminder that at the beginning, the United States remained neutral. We were going to trade with both sides, provide supplies to both sides. And then President Wilson also did not want to get involved in the war. He was an isolationist and even in his re-election campaign, kept us out of war. So I'm going to play this little clip for you, and it's a clip from Finding Nemo. And so we're going to be looking at the war at sea. And this is one of the reasons why the United States was brought into this. So mining the sea, and here's a picture of an actual mine that was in the sea. And you're going to see that they are in this video clip. Um, when I visited the World War I Museum in Kansas City, this was on display, and because of teaching about this, I was able to know what it was without reading about it. Here's some other images. And so mining the sea by using mines, you could use that offensively or defensively in the war, but it's putting these hidden bombs that explode when um, they're disturbed. Another term that you need to know is a blockade, and this is by cutting off, uh, cutting off access to prevent goods, supplies, or people from entering or leaving. And then unrestricted submarine warfare is fighting with a submarine. And so this, you would have gained some of this information by reading the U-boat attack play that you were supposed to have read. <clears throat> Number four said, what did Britain do to try to force Germany into surrendering? If you take a look at this map, here's Germany. And here is Britain. And if the United States was going to supply both sides and being neutral, they would have to either sail their merchant ships through here or through here. Well, the British put a blockade along the northern part of the North Sea and right here in the English Channel. So this prevented the United States from really being able to supply Germany with any supplies. And so Germany was trying to block, or sorry, Britain was trying to block Germany's only access to the ocean. So one way that Germany is going to respond is they're going to do a blockade of their own. And so they're going to be using those submarines or U-boats, and they're not going to have any restrictions on who they are going to target. And so they threaten to sink any ship, doesn't matter if it's from the United States, if it's a civilian ship, if it's a military ship. This is why it's called unrestricted. If you visit Chicago, you might have gone to the Museum of Science and Industry, and they actually have an exhibit of a German U-boat. And so here's a picture right here. And so this is their own type of blockade. Right here, um, I should pulled this up. These red dots indicate ships that were sunk by Germany with the use of the unrestricted submarine warfare. And this is just a nine month period. So you could see that'd be pretty dangerous for a US ship to try to deliver 
any goods over to Germany, which would be over here. And you can see that pretty much um, this is pre preventing Britain from getting any supplies because people, ships are getting sunk. The captain and crew of the Lusitania dismissed fears of submarines and encouraged passengers to enjoy the elegant amenities on board the 787-foot luxury liner. Vacationing couples on the lower decks enjoyed shuffleboard, while the wealthy travelers in first class were served high tea in the veranda cafe. From intercepted communications, the British knew the German submarine U-20 was lurking in the path of the Lusitania. Yet they chose not to send destroyers out to meet the ship and escort it into Liverpool. Within the halls of the British Admiralty, some argued that if the Lusitania was lost, it might precipitate American entry into the war. British are definitely trying to get America involved in this war. Right from the beginning, there is a sense of, we need you here. Your shipping is not going to be enough. We are your brethren. You must support us. On Friday, May 7th, as passengers excitedly scanned the horizon for their first sight of land, a torpedo hit the ship's side. The explosion ripped a huge gash in the Lusitania. It took only 18 minutes for the Leviathan to slide beneath the waves. For months after the Lusitania went down, dead bodies washed ashore. Hundreds of others were pulled lifeless from the Irish Sea. The corpses stacked on the docks. Many of the casualties could not be identified and were buried in mass graves. In all, 1,198 men, women, and children were lost. 128 of them were Americans. Neutrality. So the Lusitania obviously is a British cruise ship and it is sailing and picking up passengers between the United States and Britain. And at the time, as you just watched, Germany is using its um, unrestricted submarine warfare. So the Lusitania actually gets torpedoed. Now, a little bit we know more about this is that uh, Britain probably took the risk of having Americans on the ship because they wanted the United States to actually side with them and get pulled into the war on their side, and is that one of the roles of government is to protect its citizens. And so if Americans die at the hands of the Germans, you would think that the American government would, that would be enough for us to get involved in the war, but it's not enough. It's just one of the reasons why we get pushed or pulled into the war, but it's not enough. Do still remain neutral. So after um, the threaten, threaten fr threat from President Wilson, Germany apologizes, promises not to attack merchant ships. Um, however, Britain wants the U.S. in the war and Germany wants to keep us out of the war at all costs. Now thinking about if you, going back to that slide that showed all those red dots, if you were a private shipper, would you want to take a chance in delivering goods to Britain or to Germany? It's probably not too safe. So this is going to influence, um, this is going to play a role in the U.S. economy. If we don't take sides in the war, then we might end up losing money. And so here's another thing that's kind of pushing us to 
take sides. So uh, there are four main events that push us towards the war. The first one is the sinking of the Lusitania. So this happens in May 7, 1915. <clears throat> and after this, Germany temporarily stops the unrestricted submarine warfare, but we do know that they end up resuming it. The second thing... On the afternoon of January 31st, 1917, the president received a diplomatic communique. The German government had declared all-out submarine warfare against American ships in the Atlantic. So that's about two years later. So it's two years where they respected the restrictions on submarine warfare. But now they were willing to take a chance on pulling the United States into the war. Handwritten code books, the stuff of codes based on a printed text eventually fall out of fashion. But homemade, handwritten code books, the stuff of spy movies, are essential in a time before computers, especially in times of war, when capturing an enemy's codes meant the difference between life or death. For the first three years of World War I, British and German armies slaughter each other in the mud of northern France. By 1917, Britain is desperate for help from the United States. Germany is equally desperate that America doesn't join the war. The interception and decoding of this single encrypted message is a major factor in forcing President Woodrow Wilson to declare war on Germany. In the days before computers and the World Wide Web, communicating with the world is a much slower and potentially dangerous business. At the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the world is connected together by telegraph. Uh, cables have been physically laid between countries right across the Atlantic, across the Mediterranean to North Africa, and those are the lines of communication. There is a web across the world of these physical cables across land and under the sea which enable countries to communicate with each other. But just like its modern counterpart, this telegraph network is open to hackers. In this case, the British government has been listening in on all German messages crossing the Atlantic since 1914. Using the diplomatic code 0075, which the British have only recently discovered and not yet fully cracked. So when a coded telegram sent from Berlin to the German minister in Mexico is intercepted in January 1917, it's a race to decode it. The first thing the code breakers of room 40 do is start looking for numbers that make up the word stop, the telegraphic method of ending sentences. They then decrypt a very high number at the end of the message, the signature of Arthur Zimmerman, the German foreign secretary. They then spot strange combinations of numbers that decode into letters which don't make sense by themselves. A R I Z O N A or Arizona, a word not listed in the 10,000 word German code book. So it's been made up phonetic of high code groups in the message. They conclude that these make up the words Texas and New Mexico. As they crack the code, the significance of the message becomes clear. Germany is proposing to support Mexico if they invade the U.S. As a reward, Mexico will regain control of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. This is not only a deliberate act of aggression on Germany's part, it's also a diversionary tactic. If the U.S. is busy fighting its neighbor, it won't get involved in the war in Europe. So, the Zimmerman telegram is the third thing that brings the United States into war. Um, that secret telegram that you had to analyze for your primary source, and then the idea that Mexico, if they end up helping Germany and going on the side of the central powers, that at the war, when the war is over, they're going to help, Germany is going to help Mexico get its land back or some of the land back that it had lost to the United States.
Today, military history, 1917. The text of the Zimmerman telegram is published on the front pages of American newspapers, propelling the U.S. towards war. The telegram was a secret diplomatic communication from the German Foreign Secretary, Arthur Zimmerman, who proposed a Mexican-German alliance should the U.S. enter war with Germany, who was preparing to renew their policy of unrestricted naval warfare and expected America to respond. Intercepted and deciphered by British intelligence in January, the message was shared with U.S. President Woodrow Wilson on February 26th. He warned Congress to prepare for German attacks and authorized the State Department to release the telegram publicly. The next month, the United States formally joined World War I. And then the fourth reason or event that brought the United States into the war is actually the most confusing. It has to do with Russia or the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution. The year is 1914. World War I had begun, and Russia was at war with Germany. The working class and the peasants make up the Russian army. However, they are not well equipped or trained for the battles to come. The year is now 1917. Millions of Russians had been either killed or wounded. The Russian people were angry at Tsar Nicholas II for getting Russia into the war and several other reasons, including the Tsar taking personal command of the army, Rasputin's power over the royal family, food shortages, and growing political opposition. The first revolution came about in February 1917 on the Julian calendar. In if you've ever watched the cartoon about Anastasia, um, Anastasia would have been in Tsar Nicholas's palace. Petrograd, which was the capital of Imperial Russia. Demonstrators protested about the lack of bread due to rationing and were soon joined by striking workers. The army was called upon to suppress the uprising. Several protesters were shot and killed by the soldiers. However, many refused to open fire. The army too, it seemed, had mutinied against the Tsar. Or October 24 and 25 on the Julian calendar, the Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, launched a coup d'etat against the provisional government. They stormed the Winter Palace and arrested the provisional government, putting themselves in charge of Russia's government. After the revolution, the Bolshevik government exited the war by signing a peace treaty with Germany called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. So now that uh, there is no more fighting between Russia and Germany and Austria-Hungary on the Eastern Front, all of these German troops can now go and fight against the British and the French on the Western Front. That is not going to be something that the British and the French are going to look too kindly on because they have already been devastated. This is another reason why the United States feels that if they don't join in the war, then France will fall to Germany and then the United Kingdom. And France had been our friend during the American Revolution. So we really need to um, go in and back them up. So these four things end up bringing the United States into the war.